Good evening. So good to see y'all tonight. Welcome to our Wednesday evening services. As you can see, Art's not here. He uh, He's still in Costa Rica uh, with the mission group. So uh, you're stuck with me tonight. I think they'll be back tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow night. Can't remember. Friday night, I think. Is it Friday night? Okay. Are there any announcements? I normally have bulletin up here Sunday morning. I didn't grab it a while ago, so are there any new announcements? Daniel's doing pretty good, isn't he? So everything went good with Daniel's surgery. Uh, anyone else? Well, we're having a real birthday party Saturday. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll send out a message for that too. Bill Lovelady, he turned 90, what, Monday or Tuesday? Yesterday. yesterday. So he turned 90 years old yesterday and was going to have a little party for him in the fellowship building. What time Saturday? From 2 to 4. From 2 to 4. Huh? <laughs> so when Bill found out it was just from two to four, he said that won't be long enough to visit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we love Bill. So if y'all can make it from two to four to Fellowship Building, Bill Love Lady's 90th birthday. Anyone else? Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Royce Morgan family. Okay. Lost their five-year-old son, grandson. Yeah. Well, you may have said that. I'm not sure. Anyone else? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray before you. We're so thankful for this time we have to come together as your children and worship you and pray that we learn more about you and apply it to our lives. And Pray, Father, you'll be with us in everything we do, think, and say, not only here tonight, but all through our daily walk of life. Pray that we set a good example and bring others to you and tell others about you. Pray, Father, you'll be with all those just mentioned on our prayer list and pray that you'll be with the Royce Morgan family and comfort them as only you can. And pray, thankful Father, that everything went well with Daniel Wilkerson's surgery and pray that he continues to make a full recovery. Pray that you'll bless him in that situation. Pray that you'll be with us all. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of do what I do a lot of times on a Sunday night sermon where I kind of get on a topic and have you turn to different passages. I think that's good exercise to turn to the scripture. So open your Bibles up anywhere and we'll be, uh, we'll be by there directly, I guess. We'll, uh, I guess we'll start in Psalm, Psalm 118. The 118th Psalm. I don't know where I came up with this, but I have saved it on my phone. And apparently, I saved it pretty recently. My memory is just getting worse and worse. 
guy I work with, he says his, his rememorator is getting worse and worse. Well, my rememorator is getting worse too. I don't know where I got this. I don't know if it was off of a website. I don't know if it was somebody shared it on Facebook. I don't know. But it says uh, there's a lot of uh, scriptures here. Well, really, they don't have any scriptures. I had to look up the scriptures. They got, um, who, who is Jesus to you is at the top of it. And, and as I go through this list, um, you, you're reminded of how relatable Jesus is. I mean, even though, even though he's the son of God, you think, well, how can we relate to that? Even though he never sinned, you think, well, how in the world can we relate to that? Yet Jesus is such a personal Savior, he can get on anybody's level at any time if you'll let him. And he's relatable to all of us. And uh, let's, I mean, we'll go through a few of these. To the architect, he is the chief cornerstone. So if you're an architect, you can, you can relate to Jesus because he's the chief cornerstone. Lance, you're a builder. You've got that, you've got that master corner, don't you, that you, from which all points are... You can trace back, everything back to that one corner, right? Is, is that how you do it? So Jesus is this, he's the chief cornerstone. From him, all the lines are drawn, right? Everything traces back to him. He's the starting point. So he, he's the chief cornerstone. There, this uh, prophecy here in Psalm 118, uh, starting verse 22 the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So as you think about that, he's the, he, he's the stone which the builders rejected. But he's also, which stone is he to you? Is he... The rejected stone, or is he the chief cornerstone? Uh, turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look at a, the fulfillment of this. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verses... 19 through 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So are being built. And you know, as the, as the church continues to grow, as people are saved, you know, the Lord adds daily to the church those who are being saved. As he does that, the, the church continues to be built. Now, of course, the, the foundational truths and all of that, that... You can't add to that, but I'm talking about the people who are being saved continually gets added to the church, so you are being built. And uh, we talked about Jesus being a, uh, a carpenter, and uh, a lot of the research I've done says he might have even been more like a stonemason than a carpenter. That, that's the type of uh, carpentry that they would have been doing in that in that area at that time probably did work with some wood but probably worked with a lot of, of stone stone masonry so with that thought go to one more passage and it's a parallel to this first peter chapter two and y'all probably remember we just covered this 
in our Sunday morning class not long ago. Larry? Oh, Lance? Uh-huh. It's like said it's more of a rock or great lake. And uh, the way this reads, it said it's a place of uh, two falls uh, keep them together and stay together and grow to form an arc. So like in uh, framing, when we stand up two walls and we go back and we top plate it, and we, that way we stagger them to where we've got the walls held together. Yeah. So And what, I think it's in Colossians chapter 1, in him all things consist, as some translations say, all things hold together. So there you go. Thank you for that. And here in 1 Peter chapter 2, very similar uh, to what we just read in Ephesians. Of course, the same Holy Spirit had Paul write that down in Ephesians. He had Peter write it down here. Coming, uh, verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up. And there's that same term, are being built up. A spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And, that, and then he, then he uh, quotes the 118th Psalm, and uh, even part of Isaiah 28 here, I believe. Uh, Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense." So he's a stone to everybody. He's either your stumbling stone or he's your chief cornerstone. So, uh, and and we're not going to dwell. It's already 12 after 7. I've got a whole big long list here and I've just covered one. So we better move on. Uh, So to the architect, he is the chief cornerstone. To the astronomer, he is the sun, and that's the S-U-N, the son of righteousness. Uh, Turn over to the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, this prophecy about Jesus. Malachi chapter 4. Uh, We'll start in verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will will stubble, will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, the S-U-N, Son of Righteousness, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. So he's the son, S-O-N. He's also the S-U-N, the son of righteousness. He, he shines. I mean, he's the light of the world. He, he shines in a dark place. And so to the astronomer, he is the son of righteousness. Okay, to to the baker, he is the living bread. Turn over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And this is after he has fed the multitudes with five loaves and the two fish and the 
people are following him. They want more physical bread. And, uh, and now he's telling them it's not about that. It's about, you know, it's about the spiritual bread. And then uh, he makes a comparison with, uh, with Moses giving the manna in the wilderness. And uh, actually, I think they're the ones that bring it up. Uh, verse 30, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So, to the baker, he is the living bread. And uh, there's other, I'm sure there's other passages we could have used for this, but uh, kind of pressed for time, so we'll move on. To the banker, he is the hidden treasure. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Verse 21, Sermon on the Mount. There's several scriptures that talk about treasure, spiritual treasure. So, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, we need to ask ourselves the question, is our, is our treasure Jesus? Do we, is he like a treasure to us? Let's look at a couple more, uh, just a few chapters over. Matthew chapter 13 Uh, Matthew chapter 13, talking about the kingdom of heaven, verses, uh, uh, verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It is the is the kingdom, is, is this church like a treasure to you? I hope so. I hope you really look forward to being here tonight. Um, where is our treasure? Uh, I, I can think of one more. Uh, it's in Psalm 119. I did not look this up. I think I've got the right verse. And if it's not... Uh, we may not be able to find it because Psalm 119 is really, 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 really long. Matter of fact, Eddie Clore has an entire commentary on the 119th Psalm. Did y'all see that back in the foyer? I can't wait to read that. It's, I mean, that thing's thick, and it's on one psalm. Uh, let's see here. Psalm 119. I hope it's 162. Yes. Verse 162 I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. So every time, you know, every day, we should find time, we should make time, actually, to read God's word, and it's like a spiritual treasure hunt. Every time, every time you open it up, I see something new. And you think about that. I mean, it's it's timeless. It uh, it's so applicable. That's a lot of syllables for me. It's so applicable to everyone. 
if you'll let it into your life, it, you know, I rejoice that your word is one who finds great treasure. Every time we open it up, it's like a, a spiritual treasure hunt. So uh, let's move on. We've got several more to cover. It's getting bad when I'm having to, I've got my glasses on. I still can't read it. Let's see. Okay. To the, to the biologist, he is the life. You remember John 14, 6? You can turn there if you want, but you don't have to because we're going to move on pretty quick. But John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say I am a way. I am a truth. You know, today's society says, well, you got your truth, I got my truth. No, that ain't the way it works. You got the truth. You got the truth. You know, truth is being treated as uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I've completely drawn a blank. Uh, relevant? Is that the word I'm looking for? Relative. Thank you. I knew it wasn't relevant, but I couldn't come up with nothing else. Relative. You got your truth, and I got my truth. No, that ain't the way it works. Jesus is the truth. He is the truth, the he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So, to the biologist, he is the life. Okay, back to uh, building. Uh, the carpenter. To the carpenter, he is the sure foundation. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. Verse 6. And I looked this up on the in a different translation, I believe. Yeah, I know I did. I'm in the New King James, but the one I looked up. I'm actually reading from the, the ESV on my phone right now, so it was on the ESV. It said sure foundation. Uh, Isaiah 33, 6, wisdom and knowledge will be the sure foundation. And I, I, I really like that better. The New King James here says the stability of your times. I believe it was the ESV I was in. Does anybody have the ESV opened up right now? Does anybody have a translation that says sure foundation right here in verse 6? The NIV does. So wisdom and knowledge will be the sure foundation and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I could have used this verse for the treasure also. So he's the sure foundation. I think that's even the, one of our songs, isn't it? Don't we have a song? I don't I don't think we sing it that much. Isn't there a song called He's the Sure Foundation? It may not be in our book. I, I can't remember. I think I've heard that. Okay. Okay, maybe that's what it is. All right. To the doctor, he is the great physician. Turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, uh, verse, well, let's back up a couple of verses. About verse 15, now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats with and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is our physician. I mean, you look at all the healing that he done, the physical healing that he done. Uh in his ministry, 
more important, I mean, that was awesome, but more importantly, he heals us spiritually. Uh, so he's the great physician. His, his blood is the, the cure-all for sin, isn't it? To the educator, he is the great teacher. Turn to Matthew 4, verse 23. Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Teaching, preaching, and healing. There's another verse, I think it's about chapter 9, that's pretty much verbatim. It's word for word what you have right here. He was teaching and preaching and healing. Okay. To the farmer, he is the sower and Lord of the harvest. Turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and it's a kind of a, a lengthy reading here but uh, we'll, we'll read just a few verses in, in verse 4 and when a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city he spoke by a parable a sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. This is not the only place he that the New Testament talks about, uh, you know, uh, the farm. First uh, Corinthians chapter fifteen talks about it. Uh, Philip, you being a farmer, when you when you read this, you, you relate to this, don't you? You guess. Well, I was hoping you'd be more confident in that. But I mean, every one of us can find something we can relate to Jesus. Now, how awesome is that? The creator of the universe, you know, he is the word. Everything was created through him and for him. By him all things consist. I mean, you think, well, there's no way we can relate to that. Yeah, we can. He, he gets down on our level. He's relatable. He's a, he's a personal savior. He's the personal savior. Uh, if I had a title for this tonight, I was thinking... On the way here, relatable, relatable, relatable. What, you know, I, Art, he puts these three-point sermons up here, and they all start, every point starts with the same letter. That's something you can remember really well, so I thought, relatable, relatable. And then, big dummy me, I finally figured it out. He's, relate, he's the relatable redeemer. He's the relatable redeemer. Uh, he, he's got something for all of us. And it looks like we're out of time to... I had 
Oh, we didn't even get halfway done. We got a maybe, possibly halfway done. I'll, I'll read. I'll, I'll read some of these. To the architect, he is the chief cornerstone. To the astronomer, he is the son of righteousness. To the baker, he is the living bread. To the banker, he is the hidden treasure. To the biologist, he is the life. To the carpenter, he is the sure foundation. To the doctor, he is the great physician. To the educator, he is the great teacher. To the farmer, he is the sower and lord of the harvest. To the florist, he is the lily of the valley. To the geologist, he is the rock of ages. Ages. To the horticulturist, he is the true vine. To the judge, he is the righteous one. To the juror, he is the true witness. To the jeweler, he is the pearl of great price. And there's about seven or eight more here, and I know we're out of time. So uh, think about that, the relatable redeemer. Philip? <laughs> yeah, did a lot of praying, yep. Thanks for your comments.
Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening worship service here at Commissary. We're certainly pleased that you're here. If you're visiting with us, we invite you to join us anytime you have an opportunity. We have a nursery, should anyone need that, just out the double doors and to the left. It'd be a good time to silence your electronic devices if you hadn't already done so. Um, remind you of our time of services. Next time we'll be meeting together as a congregation will be Sunday morning at 9.30. Our worship is about 10.05. Of course, we meet Sunday evening at 5.30 and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I've got uh, some announcements. Some are the same as, as Sunday, and I'll try to go through these. Um, uh, and uh, maybe I'll, I won't skip any one. Let's remember those uh, that are on our prayer list that are, that are sick. We're uh, certainly pleased that uh, Daniel Wilkerson is doing good after his surgery this week. And uh, uh, we also want to remember that Julie Lloyd will have a CT scan on her heart on April the 1st. Uh, please continue to remember Judy Latham. Uh, she's still having issues and uh, and, and she certainly needs our, our prayers. And also uh, remember uh, Danny Felty. Uh, he's uh, has had, you know, he's had a stroke, and hopefully things are going to be better for him. But let's let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, we're happy. Uh, Larry and Renee Kitchens are back with us uh, tonight. They they've been sick, but they're they're doing much better now. And. Uh, also, uh, one of Larry Reddick's friends, uh, the Royce Morgan family, uh, they lost, uh, the Royce <coughs> lost his five-year-old uh, grandson in an accident. He was killed uh, by a bus in Saudi Arabia, and they're going to be traveling there. So please remember that family. Um, I... Uh, took my dad to uh, Burger King almost every morning for years. And we got acquainted with uh, several people that were up there. And uh, there was a table over here that was called the Table of Knowledge. Of course, I didn't sit at that table. But <laughs> anyway, one of the men that we got acquainted with uh, uh, named Lonnie Elmore had heart surgery uh, Monday. And he's having issues. And you can just, as you pray, just remember it's one of my dad's friends. And so hopefully he'll be doing okay, but uh, he's, he's having several issues at this point. Uh, are there other sick that need to be mentioned? Uh, please remember uh, Art and the students that are in Costa Rica. Uh, last report I heard, they were having a real good trip, and I think they'll be back in Memphis late uh, Friday night, I believe, is when they will be here. And uh, also uh, remember our seniors, and we mentioned this some weeks ago. We're going to honor our seniors here at Commissary on April the 7th. And, uh, and then we'll have a potluck uh, after services on that evening, that Sunday evening. So please remember that, and, uh, and uh, we're thankful for our seniors every year. I think that's all the announcements that I have. Are, are there others that need to be made? In our services uh, tonight, uh, Wes will be leading our singing. I'll be uh, extending the invitation in just a few minutes. Rick Dickinson will lead us in our closing prayer when we end our service. And now as we begin our worship service, Philip Rowe will lead us in our opening prayer. all bow together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to Thee for life. And we're thankful, Father, for all the blessings that we enjoy. Thankful, Father, for everything that we have here on earth. And help us, Father, to always realize that You are the creator of all these things. We're thankful, Father, for Your love for us and sending Thy Son to die on the cross so that we might have the hope of spending eternity with Thee in heaven. Thankful, Father, for everything that he's done for us, and help us, Father, to return that love to him by keeping your commandments. 
thankful, Father, for the country that we live in. We're thankful, Father, for all the freedoms that we have here, and we ask that these freedoms would continue. We ask also that you would be with those that work daily to ensure that we have these freedoms, keep them safe as they do their duties. Thankful, Father, for those that labor for you, especially those, Father, that labor in foreign fields. We ask, Father, again, that you would keep them safe as they discharge their duties and help us to do the things that we can to aid them in this work. We're thankful, Father, for our families. We ask, Father, that you would always be with them and bless them in everything that they need. Keep them always safe, healthy, and happy. And be a guide to them as they live their lives. Thankful, Father, for you. We're, we're very thankful, Father, for you for giving us our lives. Be with us, Father, throughout the eternity of our lives. Forgive us, Father, when we sin. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You'd uh, like to turn your Bibles to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be looking at a verse or two there in a few minutes. 
As you're turning, you may remember that Genesis chapter 6 through 9 is the account of Noah and the ark and the flood. And uh, chapter 6 uh, gives Noah instruction on how to build that ark. The Lord gave it to him. And uh, we're going to uh, not look at uh, how many animals was on the boat or how long it rained or whatever. We're going to look uh, at three things that I believe uh, that Noah did or three attributes he possessed that we could learn from and imitate. Um, you know, that, uh, that ark that, that Noah built was really a big boat. And the reason I know it was a big boat, last year we went to Kentucky where the replica of Noah's ark is located. And uh, it's really big. If you ever get a chance to go up there, it's worth your trip. Uh, I've even got some pictures of it. It almost takes two, two pictures to take the length of that boat. So we're going to look at, uh, at three things that I believe uh, we can learn from Noah. Now, if we go back to chapter 5, uh, of Genesis, uh, the uh, genealogy from Adam down to Noah and the flood is given. And if my math is correct, from Adam to the flood is 1,656 years, give or take a little. And in those 1,650 plus years, uh, man forgot about God. Uh, he became very wicked and that's all he thought about. There are several generations from Adam to Noah, but I've heard it said and I believe it, it just takes two generations to lose the Lord if we don't teach our children. But I'd like to look uh, uh, first at uh, at uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 5 through 8. It kind of sums up what, what the Lord uh, thought about mankind. Read with me if you've got your Bible open. And, lo <clears throat> and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, it seems that Noah was the only one that was pleasing to God. And the first thing I'd like to notice about Noah that we can follow uh, Noah didn't follow the crowd. He did not follow the crowd. He wasn't influenced in a bad way by those people around him. Now, we shouldn't be influenced by the people around us today that are not good influences. Paul said the same thing in other words uh, to us. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and really verse 2 but I'm gonna, is, is, is the statement I was looking for, but I'm going to read both, both verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. And that's it. That's what Noah 
did not do. He wasn't conformed to those people around him. That's what we should strive not to do. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the first thing we noticed about Noah is he wasn't conformed to the world. He didn't follow the crowd. Now the second thing I want to look at about, about Noah, he, uh, he followed instructions. In chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, I'm going to read those. These are, these are the instructions that God gave him. I'm sure God gave him other instructions also. We just don't have them in front of us. And he said to Noah, in verse 14, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And you shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And if you were a builder and didn't really think it through how big a cubit was, how long it was, uh, you might think, well, that, we can do that. But it was really a big deal. Uh, we know that God gave Noah other instructions. He would have had to. But in that replica of the ark in Kentucky, in the center of that ark, there are beams that support that structure that are three feet around and 50 feet long, long. Themes. And, uh, you know, there's a sign in the ark that says there is 3.1 million board feet in that ark. That much lumber in the replica. I don't know how much was in Noah's ark, but it was made of wood and it was the same size. A board foot is a board that's one inch thick, one inch wide, one inch long. And if you laid 3.1 million one foot by one foot by one inch boards end to end, they would reach from Williamstown, Kentucky to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was a big task. And Noah followed directions. Um, you know, we're given directions also, and we need to follow them. Now, God doesn't speak to us like he did Noah. He speaks to us through his written word, through the Bible. And if we're going to be pleasing to God like Noah was, then we're going to have to follow his directions and not just follow part of them. We're going to have to follow all of them just like Noah did. So Noah was good at following directions. And we need to be also. Uh, Noah didn't follow the crowd. He followed directions that God gave him. And then the third and the last thing I want to notice, that Noah was patient. And you might say, how do I know he was patient? Well, if you think about it and look in chapter 5, just as it's ending before the beginning of chapter 6, Noah is 500 years old, and he has just had three sons. Now, in a few verses later, God tells him, build this ark, and here's how I want you to build it. So I'm assuming Noah went to work. And in chapter 7, verse 6, we see that when the floods came, Noah was 600 years old. So that tells me it took him about 100 years to build 
that ark. But that takes patience. Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 15, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he was building the ark. He was preaching either by example, by people looking at him, or actually preaching to the people of his day for upwards to a hundred years. You know, God's timing is always perfect. And what he says is always going to come true. And like Noah, we need to be patient in the waiting period. As Evan said, 41. You know, things happen. Evan gave a lesson uh, Sunday evening about 40 days, 40 years, 40 whatever. We need to be we need to be patient while we're, we're waiting for the Lord to come. We need to do what Noah did. He followed God's commands. He was a preacher of righteousness. He was patient. He didn't follow the crowd. And we should be the same. You know, we are in a world today that's not a lot different, in my view, than maybe the world that Noah was in. There's a lot of evil in our world. And now we are, like Noah was that hundred years, he was waiting for the flood and building the ark and preaching. And what we need to do, I think, until Jesus comes back, until our life ends, we need to be patient. We need to be preaching the word. We need to be showing Christ by example. We need to be not following the crowd. I'd like to close by reading what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 42. <clears throat> but of that day and hour, no one knows, <clears throat> not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men were, will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So the lessons from Noah are lessons that we need to incorporate in our lives also. We need to be working. We need to be not following the crowd. We need to be patient. If there's anything we can do tonight for you, if you have any need, come now as we stand and sing. Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The heart 
Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to study your word. We thank you for this lesson that we've received tonight. And Father, we ask that we too would be the recipients of your grace. We know that you give it to us whether we deserve it or not. And I just ask that we strive to be the type of person that he was. Father, we many sick have been mentioned and we ask that you would be with them and if it be your will that you would restore them to their health, that you would guide the hands that minister to them and that you would just help them to recover. Father, as we leave this place, we ask that you would go with us, that you would protect us. Father, especially that you would protect our children because they are the church of the future. Forgive us when we fail you because we know that we often do that. These things we ask in your son's name.